Hello. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming out on this fine Wisconsin spring day, <laughs> or winter four coming tonight, I believe, right? So thank you sincerely for coming out, because I'm getting a lot of messages from people that are upset they couldn't be here, and never in my life did I ever think someone would ever say that. So thank you for coming out. So I want to embarrass myself first, because... On the topic of weight loss, as, as if some of you know my story, you know I've lost quite a bit of weight. But when you do that, there's always the transition from the boxes of clothes that you have, right? You have your fit me when I'm at my heaviest clothes. You have your you can wear everyday clothes. You have your on a good day I can wear these clothes. And then you have your goal clothes, right? So. I went, if you've ever been to any of our events here, like in the big auditorium, we had our leadership and longevity a couple years ago. And it wasn't until like an hour into that event, I realized that I had my fat pants on. <laughs> I, was, I kept walking around wondering why they're so baggy, and at the end of the day, I looked, I was like, son of a gun, I wore the wrong pants. So I got rid of them, which I'm upset about, because I was going to wear them tonight and do a little show for you as I drop them down, but... <laughs> So our goal here at Wellness Way events is typically always the same, and that's to make people mad, right? Not by being mean, but by, well, let me put it this way. Let me ask some questions. Who's bought more than one weight loss book? <laughs> Lots of hands. Who's bought more than one workout program? P90X, anybody? Insanity? Oh, that was a bear. That was horrible. So when we get into these things, um, those different diets, some of them work great for us, right? Some work great for your friend, and they suck for you. Some of them did okay, right? But when you really get into it, what happens when you get like a day or two away from those things? They start collecting dust, right? And then everything kind of falls by the wayside, and you get back to it. And then you say, oh, I'll try something new. You go get some wraps. It works. Tried those, seen those. They work for a little bit, right? The weight loss supplements, the weight loss shakes, the weight loss drinks. We spend tons and tons of money on stuff. And that's what should make us mad is that because when they target people for those, I even talk about when my metabolic syndrome book, I have a 30-day meal plan in there. And if you were to follow that, it could actually make you very sick, okay? So no diet out there is you driven, right? It, they're all, it's, you know, when you get down to it, it it's, it's money driven. So what I want to get across to you tonight is that none of you should leave here with a goal of losing weight. Now, it's a weight loss talk. It says it right there, okay? But what, your, what should be your goal? Get to get healthier, right? Because what happens when you get healthier and you're overweight? You lose weight. It's as simple as that, okay? So... Who here has a goal weight? Keep them up there really high. Goal weight, you got a number in mind. That's the best way to fail. <laughs> right? Because what you'll do to hit that number is insane. Right? And what happens when you hit that number? You stop. Or you get down a little bit below it, and then you're like, yes, I'm good. And then, whoop, right back up. So I want to get that out of your head because... Ladies, especially, this is meant for you. No man, unless he was actually the dumbest man on the planet, ever walked up to a woman and say, Ooh, what do you want, 40, 150? <laughs> and if he did, what happened? He got knocked out, right? So I want you to do something. First, I want you to realize that that should be your new goal right there. <laughs> We're in a church. <laughs> It had to be edited, right? But what I want you to do for me now is, if you're here or watching online, not if you're driving. If you're driving, don't do this. You'll kill somebody. Close your eyes. All right? I want you to imagine yourself standing naked in your house by yourself. Nobody's around. Fire department's not coming. Nobody's going to sneak in. You're standing in front of a full-length body mirror. And in the mirror is your ideal body, right? You got those nice rippled abs, 
tan, toned legs and arms, strong, no puffiness in your face, no hair growing out your forehead, none of that stuff. And then you walk over to the scale and you step on it and it says a number that's 10 pounds heavier than you want it to be. What do you do? First, what you should do, you can open your eyes, is throw your scale out because right there is your enemy. This damn thing has caused more stress when it comes to weight than Twinkies have. More stress when it comes to weight than that ideal dress hanging in the closet has. This stupid thing has to be destroyed. Would you agree with me? You want to do it? Did anybody bring a hammer? I did. Yes. So did I. So if anybody needs one, and anybody has one of these at home that really drives you nuts, I want you to come up here. We'll put it on the good floor. And have at it. I'm not joking. You don't know how actually cathartic and stress relieving this is going to be. I'll do it first if you. you I have no problem with it. I think it's a dumb thing. So. Yes! That damn thing has caused her some stress. I got more. We got more. They can take multiple hits. You said you're bringing your hammer. That's what? Awesome. Thank you. Anyone? They're, they're only seven bucks. Come on. If you want to keep your scale at home, go to Walmart, buy one for seven bucks, and beat the hell out of it. You know you want to. It's time. There we go. Now it's coming apart. So we are going to keep the scales out later. If anybody would rather, you know, wait until people aren't looking and scare the crap out of somebody by nailing it when they're not looking. So here's what that scale does. It labels you. It puts a number in your head, and when do we step on it? Every day when? First thing in the morning. And when it doesn't say something that you like, what happens the rest of your day? Ruins it. Yeah. I'm going to run around, I'm going to go to the bathroom, and then I'm going to step back on it. <laughs> she did this morning. Right? Because if you can get it changed, then you're a better person. You think better of yourself. You think people are going to look at you different because of that. But we don't walk around with shirts that say 208. Right? It doesn't matter how much you weigh. You know what matters for weight is cows. Scales are for cattle. Right? Why do I say that? That's how farmers get paid. They fatten up the cows before so they can get more price per pound or more dollars per cow. So scales are for cattle. Good friend taught me that once. But when you look at these ladies right here, you have 5'2", 5'4", 5'8", 5'11", 6'1", size 14, 18, 12, 12, 10. Every single one of them weighs 150 pounds. Wow. Mm-hmm. Do you look at them and say, oh, she looks 150. Who do we think that about? You can say it. Ourselves. Say it. Ourselves. Okay? So if anything comes up where you look at this and all of a sudden somebody else took a picture of themselves and they added to it, she also weighs 150. Now, what doesn't that tell you? Who's healthy and who's sick? I guarantee you the one on the right is the sickest. And the one on the left is probably the other sickest. Why? Because look at that look on her face. She's miserable. Right? So when you look at this, you can't judge somebody's health by a number. You can't judge your own health by a number. Because if you go and you work out and you build muscle and you build muscle and you're getting stronger and you're getting fitter and all this stuff, what happens to the number on the scale? It goes up. Number always goes up on the scale when you start working out before it goes down. Always. Because you gain muscle faster than you lose fat. That's just the way the body works. 
So here's the biggest point we have to get across, because if you came with somebody and you start doing stuff like working out, trying to exercise, and doing things to lose weight together, and one of you loses weight and the other doesn't, you start to get angry. Be happy for that person because this stuff is hard, right? So don't let comparison steal your joy. Now, we all do it. Ladies are worse than men. Now I'll explain why. We all go on Instagram. We find that fitness smile. We look and say, ooh, I want to look like that. And then you look in the mirror, you don't look like that, and you get pissed. And you get upset. And we get stressed. And we get stressed about it, right? Or we look at our friends. They lost 10 pounds on this diet. I tried the same thing, and I gained five. Right? So when we go through all this stuff, we got to make sure that we're looking at ourselves, not other people. If you get up in the morning and you eat something nutritious versus a bowl of cereal, be happy for yourself. Pat yourself on, pat yourself on the back. Do a little dance. Do a little jig. Turn off your phone. Right? So that's how women do it. You know what men do? They look, in the, they look at those pictures of the guys. Well, they look, probably look more at the girls. But when they look at the guys, what do they think? Oh, yeah. About the same. <laughs> Pretty close. A guy doesn't look in the mirror and think, oh, look at that. Look at this. Ugh. What do we do? Oh, man, I'm awesome. I'm looking good today. Right? Well, don't step on the scale. Right? And don't get down on yourself. Be like a guy. Just... Just be like that. So, and then men and women, women especially, don't compare yourself to men. I got a funny story that's happened yesterday with Jess. If anybody's been to our office and met Jess, if you walk in and she's there, guaranteed you're going to be smiling in a couple of seconds. She's awesome. Hopefully she's watching online because now I don't have to buy her chocolate. But Jess is getting on her husband because he was doing some sassy things and he was starting to get puffy and starting to gain a couple pounds. So she swapped out his bad jerky and stuff from the gas station, bought him some good stuff. And two days later, she's looking at him, she's like, take off your sweatpants and go step on the scale. And he starts laughing, and he's like, why? She's like, just do it. And he had lost two pounds in two days. And she started to get mad at him. I was like, what are you doing? That's your own fault. You're the one who gave him the healthy food. Don't get mad that he's, getting, don't get mad that he's losing weight, and you're the one get, making him lose weight. <laughs> so... Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, anyway, I digress. But so anyway, come to our office, say hi to Jess, and tell her not to yell at her husband. So who's done some of these? Yeah, I have. Now, when you break these down, really, unless your name is Keto or Ekans or Paleo, these aren't individualized food plans, are they? They are ways of eating. Now, they are not designed for you, and that's why diets suck. Because you can't go to the health food store and pull out the Roseanne diet book. You can't pull out the Brad diet book, right? They don't have them written for you, right? So you could get on one of these, you could go keto, you could go paleo, you could go zone, Whole30, Atkins, Mediterranean, whatever it is. Blood type diet. The blood type diet says you are one of four people. Look around. Is every fourth person the same? No. Break these down. Keto, no sugar. Paleo, it's real food. It's earthbound food. It's meat and cheese. Not meat and cheese. It's meat and vegetables and fruit and nuts and seeds. Zone is a certain way of dividing up your macros, proteins, carbs, and fats. Uh, Atkins is low carb. Mediterranean is low carb. Uh, South Beach, they all came out around the same time. And then the blood type is A, B, A, B, or O. I'm O. You know why that diet would work for me? Because if I go and eat the food, it's meat and vegetables. What do you do? You cut out a bunch of crap that you shouldn't be eating in the first place. And then you'll start to lose weight. But if I go on there and it says eat steak and potatoes all day, and I'm allergic to steak and potatoes, what's going to happen? You're going to get sick. Right? So that's why diets suck, because we don't have an individualized diet for you unless you've been through all that. So the two problems with most of these is that people will jump on like paleo bandwagon and say, oh, I'm all paleo, and then eat bacon and butter every day. And that's it, because bacon's allowed on paleo. Right? So I can eat paleo, I can eat bacon. And then everybody eats bacon, and it's celebrated. Trust me, I know. Um, 
And the other one, like I said, is none of them are designed for you. So which type of person are you? I like this one. Right? And, and, <laughs> and the funny thing is when you get into these and you always know those people and you may be one of them, that we always talk about our friends who, you know, eat 10 gallons of food and they eat three plates and go back for leftovers and they lose two pounds. You look at chocolate and you gain five. Or you sniff a cracker, right? And you start getting all bloated. So <laughs> when we go into these, we got to set some goals up for today so we know what we're, we're aiming for after we leave here tonight. So one is a new approach to weight loss because we already stated it. What is it? It's not to lose weight. It's to get healthier. Okay? We want to examine the tools and testing available so we can assess and identify the roadblocks that actually prevent us from losing weight, especially when we're doing everything right. Isn't that the worst part? When you're doing everything right and you're still not losing weight, what does that do for you mentally? Oh, it destroys you. Right? I'm doing all those things right. I'm doing this, I'm doing this, I'm doing what this person says, I'm doing what this person says, and I'm still gaining weight. What the hell? And you become frustrated and you give up altogether and you go buy a big vat of Ben and Jerry's and go to town. And then you forget about it. Okay? And lastly, we want to understand how to develop a program that is unique for you. Not one program that works for everybody, one that works for you and you and you and you. Okay? So many of you have maybe seen this picture before. If you were there the first time I presented this, Nobody in the room realized it was me. That's pretty awesome. I just heard a sound of surprise. <laughs> Dr. Ryan, one of our newest offices down in Largo, Florida is back there. Yes, this is me. This is me about 2007, about 80 pounds ago. Now, a little bit of history on me. I grew up in a small mill town, and I lived about a block away from the airport and a block away from mini golf course. Now... My dad owned a plane, so we were at the airport a lot. And I spent most of my time by the coffee pot. Why would I do that? Nope. Better. Sugar cubes. Boxes of sugar cubes. CNH, the pink box. Oh, my goodness. I'd walk right over to it and start plopping them. And in the summer, I'd ride my bike down to the mini golf course, and I'd take my dollar, put it in the soda machine, get a 25-cent can of soda, if you remember those days. Some of you, I can tell not. <laughs> Take the rest of the money, you get a full bag of candy, and you spend the rest of the day eating that. I used to go trick-or-treating twice. <laughs> I'd go out, come home, change my costume, and go out again, hit all the same houses. <laughs> it was a science because at least one of the times you had to wear a mask that fully covered your face. And then the other time you'd go as a Packer player. That's what I would do. You'd go twice, and it would be awesome. So... All the way through grade school, all the way through high school, all the way through college, that's pretty much how I ate. I mean, I didn't eat as much candy, but I never turned it down. Never turned down a soda. We always had plenty in the house, right? I always would make sure to stop. Even when I was this time, I was a practicing physician. I was a chiropractor, which I still am. A health practitioner who would drive to work, go past work, pick up a liter of Dr. Pepper, which is by far the best soda on the planet. Okay? It was also the first, if you didn't know that. And I'd drink that in the morning, and I'd go home, take a nap, because who's got energy after drinking that much soda? I'd go back to work, I'd go back to the gas station, grab another one. Every day. Four days a week. Okay? And then I bought my practice from Dr. Patrick, and at that time, I had to get life insurance, and the nurse came, and she took my blood, did the test. The test came back, and they said, you're pre-diabetic. So I had a choice. I could keep on the path that I was on, start pricking my finger every single day, start taking my metformin, and start counting all my carbs every single day, or I could just knock it the hell off. So as of that day, I haven't had a Dr. Pepper since or a Mountain Dew, or a Pepsi, or all the other delicious things. Unless they were mixed in a drink. <laughs> but you didn't hear that from me. Okay, so I quit them, but I didn't give them up. Now, after that, immediately, it, it's kind of funny because it was kind of like when I was in chiropractic school, I did Atkins for like a month and I lost 20 pounds. 
Same thing. When you're drinking that much sugar and you stop, I had good results really quick. But then it stopped. Why? Because that wasn't the only bad thing I was doing. Right? So what I did was, when I got those test results, I switched my routine a little bit. I started drinking black coffee instead. Not all the time. I'd go get some lattes because there's a coffee shop right next to the office where you could walk over there and walk back between patients, which was sweet. And instead of cereal and other random stuff that I was eating for breakfast, I'd eat oatmeal every day. And then eat a bunch of bananas at lunch. What was I eating? Sugar. sugar. I replaced sugar with sugar. So that's why the massive amount of sugar I was eating dropped, and that's why some of the weight I was losing stopped. So I had to make another change. But I didn't because I didn't want to. I was living up north, I was a bachelor, and I was I spent all summer on the golf course drinking beers, spent all winter in the bar leagues drinking beers and playing darts. You live up north. So I lost some weight, but I stayed there forever, okay? Then I moved down to Green Bay. And shortly thereafter, I was living at Dr. Patrick's house. I was living in their basement because I had literally, within a week, decided to move from up north down to Green Bay. It took me that long. Let's, you got moved down here. Okay, now I was there the next week. So there wasn't really a plan of attack. So I was living in this basement. I didn't have a refrigerator. I didn't have a stove. I didn't have anything else where I could eat. So I didn't eat that much. And within the first couple days I was there, I lost five pounds. And I was like, whoa, this is a good, this works, right? This not eating thing is pretty sweet. Then shortly thereafter, we were taking a trip to Florida. So we did a 30-day detox. Has anybody done our 30-day detox? 10 day. 10 days first 10, then you do the rest of the 20 because you're a glutton for punishment. But when I did that, each 10 day section I lost five pounds. So within a month, just over a month of moving to Green Bay, I had lost over 20 pounds. And that was me then. Now, here's a question for you. 2008 to 2010, who looks older? You can say it. <laughs> the fat guy. Right? Blah. Me and all my chins. Uh, we, were, we were good friends for a long time. Sorry. Anyway, um, but the only thing that really changed from me moving up there to me moving down here was that I was eating less and I was still working out just as much. All of a sudden, I just started losing weight because the amount of food I was actually putting in my body stopped or slowed down drastically and I wasn't going to the bar four nights a week. Okay? So in that realm, the only thing that really changed was my diet. What happens when diets don't last? We go back. We go back to our old habits just not as often, right? So we get back on that horse of, oh, I'm just going to have a couple chips. I'm just going to have one soda this week. I'm just going to go out once this week. I'm just going to do that. So what happens to the weight? Go up. And then you stop, and then you stop doing that. It goes down. You go up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down, until you end up just on that roller coaster that we all fight with. And it sucks because you don't really think you're doing that much bad, but it just doesn't stop. You just can't get off the roller coaster. So what happened was the way I got from that middle guy to this guy to where those roller coasters don't happen anymore is I changed one little itty-bitty thing. The way I looked at food. I changed how I looked at food to fuel because I, was, I joined a CrossFit gym. If anybody's ever joined a CrossFit gym, it's tough work. And I was busting my butt in there, and my weight actually didn't even change a bit. And then they had a, it was a 21 or 30 day challenge where you could only eat paleo. That's it, for 30 days. No alcohol, no grains, no sugars, no nothing. And after that, my body changed drastically, and I was like, okay, now we're talking. But what else changed was my performance in the gym, my activity, my energy, and all this other stuff changed because I was now putting good fuel into my system that my body actually knew how to use. The bad thing is, upon further review, with the testing I've done on myself, I realized that you can't really beat a system up for 30 years and expect it to function normally when you all of a sudden start putting good stuff in right away. Right? You can't put oil in your gas tank for 10 years and expect all of a sudden you put gas in once, now you got a good running automobile. Right? So our bodies are basically machines, and if you don't put the right stuff in, you're going to get the wrong stuff out. So what I've discovered about myself is that there is a couple different types of diabetes. There is type 2, which is diabetes by lifestyle. 
There's type 1, which is a straight autoimmune. And then there's type 1A, which I call pancreatic fatigue, which is when you beat the hell out of your system so bad that you break it. You know who else did it to themselves? Tom Hanks, when he shot Castaway. He went through that drastic of a body change from skin and bones to overweight to middle that he's now on the cover of Diabetes Magazine. Literally, in my office, I have it. That he actually gave him, he developed diabetes after that movie. Because you beat your system up so bad that your pancreas is basically weak and can't rise to the occasion. So if you've been stressed out really long, you've heard of adrenal fatigue, it's the same thing, different organ, okay? So what really actually started to go wrong was that all of us were set up to fail, okay? If you see my diabetes talk, you know this a-hole, right? I can't swear because we're in a church, but I like to swear, so it's going to be tough. So bear with me. And I know we got some people down in Mississippi watching that would come up here and beat me with a stick if I do. So this guy, if you've heard of the cholesterol dilemma, let's call it, to where they said cholesterol causes fat and cholesterol cause heart attacks. We've all heard it, yes. What his equation did was say that we now eat our way to heart attacks by eating too much fat. And they were paid a boatload of money at that time, 48,000 bucks cash back in the early 80s or late 70s. That's a lot of money back then. Right? So they got paid to come up with this equation. Then he got hired by the USDA, and they drafted the first dietary goals for the United States. Now, do you know what that was? The food pyramid. Okay. Now, what do we say at the Wellness Way? If you eat like the food pyramid, you're going to look like the food pyramid. <laughs> All right, so what this did was in the late 70s, early 80s, put about this thing where we need more bread. We need a ton of bread. We need a bunch of dairy. We need some fruit and vegetables just as much as we need products that come from a huge beast of a 2,000-pound animal. Yeah, we should drink their milk. You know, the milk that's meant for the baby cow. We should drink it. I know we're in Wisconsin. That's blasphemy, but I apologize. So when it comes to this, what they did was, one, never take advice from politicians when it comes to your health, or Dr. Google. Okay, because this always pops up and this is meant to be good, healthy, nutritious, right? This is actually good and healthy when it comes to school lunches, when it comes to different programs, you go to a hospital, this is all over the place. There's a reason why it's all over the place in a hospital. That's what got you there in the first place. Okay, now, but when you follow this, I know we offend people. <laughs> so now we're gonna take this. From 1985, we're going to go out 25 years. This is going to be fun because when you look at this, this is people 30 pounds overweight for 5'4 person or looking at like a plus 30 BMI, which is if you ever calculate your BMI, throw in the garbage. It's height to weight and it's stupid. It takes professional athletes and you can label them obese, right? We're in Green Bay. Remember Donald Driver? He's always running around with his shirt off. The guy looks like he's made out of marble. He's obese by body mass index. Yes, that's how asinine it is. Anyway, so the color scheme is down here, and every darker color adds another 5% of the population that's at least 30 pounds overweight. You ready? Here we go. Because five years before, this is when the guidelines came out for the food. Nope, there's another color. There's another one. There's another one. Ever see the movie Outbreak? That's kind of what it looks like, how the map changes when everybody starts getting the disease. That's what an outbreak looks like. So an outbreak of eating junk looks like. So the bad thing is we are eight years beyond this, and the trend is just going the same direction. So where do you think we are now? I don't have an updated map, but you can imagine, right? So how then do you make an environment sick? What do you do to it? To the environment, how do we, how do we make it sick? Pollute it, right? What's pollution? It's stuff that doesn't belong there, right? Now, how do we pollute a plant? You ever try feeding a plant motor oil, what happens? 
How about a dog? Do you ever try feeding a dog xylitol or chocolate? Why wouldn't you do it? It's poison to dogs. It's really good for us, but it's not good for dogs. It makes them sick, so you wouldn't do it, right? So as we go along that, this is what the food pyramid looks like by percentages, okay? Now, the current USDA healthy diet, you can Google it, but don't listen to Google. I can go back on this. Now, 65% sugar, and then they break down the rest, protein and fat. The American Diabetes Association, 60%. They took some sugar away to make it healthier for diabetics, okay? And then protein and fat at 20%. Now, how do you make a system fat? I mean, how do you make a system fat? How do you make a person sick? Pollute it. How do you pollute it? Put stuff in there that doesn't belong. This is the composition of your brain. This is what they tell you to eat. This is what your brain's made of. What do you think this does to your brain? It starves it for its actual nutrients, and it feeds it stuff that actually destroys it. This is what your body is made of. 35% fat, 45% protein, and 5% sugar, and then you got some minerals like calcium and things like that. Right? So how do you turn this into making this healthy? So if you divide these up, you average these out, you get about 10% carbohydrate, about 50% fat, and about 40% protein. That's what your entire body is made of. This. Now, if you ate something that resembled this, what do you think would happen to your health? It would improve, right? Because you're giving it what it needs. Now, you can also give it this and make it really sick, which is the bad thing. Now, you know, the crazy thing is, you know what this diet is called? That's the Atkins diet. But, like I said, I did Atkins diet. I drank a hell of a lot of di diet cherry coke. Mm. Diet vanilla coke, sorry. Because it's fantastic. I mean, really, when you get down to it. Every day. But, there's no sugar in it. So it's allowed on the diet. That's where diets are stupid. Okay? So if it's allowed, as long as you keep your calories and your macros in the right spot, it doesn't matter how you fill them. And the body doesn't work that way. So this was actually proposed. And I, I looked at this now for probably six to eight hours trying to make sense of it. Because this is called a spectrum of health. And we all have different measurements on here that people can relate to health, right? Cholesterol, body mass index, bleh. Um, A1C, LDL, triglycerides, bone density, body fat, blood pressure, muscle mass, and all that different stuff. But here's where it goes wrong, because how do you read it? Left to right, correct? Now, can these people over here, can they be really, 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 really sick? Yes. So this actually has to be read from the bottom up. Okay? Because you can take a sick person that's really fit, and start giving their body what it needs, and they'll actually move in this direction. You can make a sick person and give them what their body needs, and they're going to move in that direction, right? So in order to be well, really, every person has to have some level of fitness, and everybody has to be moving in this direction. Now, no better example I can think of, ladies, you're welcome, than this. Who is that? Heart attack, Bob. It's Bob Harper, right? From America's, not America's, I always want to call it America's Biggest Loser. Biggest Loser. Biggest Loser, which is a tremendous show. I cry like a baby whenever I watch it, and I get made fun of a lot because of that. So what do they do on that show is not really relevant here because what they do on that show is basically beat the hell out of those people and starve them. And that doesn't work. That just puts you in a calorie deficit and puts you in fight or flight and makes you sick. But we'll get there. Okay, now the reason I bring this up is that he is a big proponent of oatmeal. He actually tweeted this. I eat oatmeal for breakfast every day. It fills me up so I'm not as tempted by holiday treats. What do you do for, to avoid temptation? I actually saw this on his Twitter and I actually responded and told him to knock it the hell off. I said, it's stupid. Why would you be eating that stuff? Now, it has nothing to do with the fact that he ended up here. Right? Now, he was a very, very fit individual, and it saved his life because he had a widowmaker. Nastiest heart attack you can have. 
He had it while at the gym, working out, but his heart was strong enough that he survived long enough to make it to the hospital. And now he's actually recovering. But I don't know if he's still eating oatmeal or not. I hope he's not eating oatmeal anymore. But why is he pushing oatmeal on that tweet? He gets paid to. Don't take health advice from government or Google or celebrities. We're going to add to the list as we go. Right? So there's no celebrity who's pushing food that's not being paid to do it. They won't do it. Okay? Now, gluten-free. That's the big thing with, with oatmeal, right? It's gluten-free. There's no such thing as a gluten-free grain. It doesn't exist on the planet. Okay? Every grain has... As we, eat the seeds of the, we eat the seeds of the plant. That's the problem. The seeds have an endosperm. Every endosperm has a prolamine, and this is the protein of that prolamine. So when you look at gliad and zine, ozin and whatever they are, however much that is is what makes that up. Gliadin is the gluten, right? Hordine is the gluten. Kefirin is the gluten of that grain. Our body does not process grains the way it should. There's a reason cows have four stomachs. Cows can eat these things and break them down and digest them properly. We can't eat the cow. Let them eat the grass, you eat the cow. And make sure it's the grass, not the corn. Okay? So our body doesn't process it, right? So when our body doesn't process the food properly, it causes inflammation in our system and starts it to break down. But the problem is when you read labels, you actually have to read the nutrition label. What happens when you read the front of the package? Lies. Lies, damn lies, and statistics, right? So I used to have a wrapper. I don't have it anymore. But it said it was gluten-free, fat-free, and cholesterol-free. It's a snack. Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? It was cotton candy. <laughs> which is 100% sugar and dye, right? So we need those artificial colors to make foods look pretty. So here they are. These are the roadblocks. So we have stress, inflammation, hormone imbalances and deficiencies, our immune system and our lifestyle. Ready to dive in? Anybody want to take, it to, take a shot at the scales quick before we get in? No? All right, let's go. Let's start with stress because there's a lot of ladies here and I'm feeling a lot of stress. There it is, okay? Who wakes up and is now got to get ready for work because you're a business professional? You have to get the kids ready because you're a parent. You have to feed them. You have to bathe them. You have to clothe them. You have to be a chauffeur and drive them to where they need to go. Then you got to go to work. Then you got to reverse the process. You got to pick them up from school, change their clothes because they spilled their lunch all over it. Every time, every time, every time. And it's never water. It's always something with oil in it. <sighs> She's six. She'll figure it out. Anyway, that's my personal issue. Anyway, you get all that done. And then by the time you're done eating and feeding them, it's time to what? Go to bed and start the day all over again tomorrow. And then you got to deal with your husband. Who all he wants at the end of the day, who going through that same stuff, is what? You can say it. We're in a church, but you can say that word. <laughs> Pastor Bob says it all the time. Pastor Mark, sorry. So you go through all this. You have all these different things. You have work. You have fear. You have late nights, time management, stress, lack of sleep, worry, all this stuff. And the crappy thing is, you know what's going to be there tomorrow? Same stuff. Same exact stuff. Okay? Now, men are no different. We go through all the exact same stressors. However... What really irritates you, ladies, is that it doesn't seem to bother us because we have a better coping mechanism. One, when we get stressed out and we do all this stuff, it doesn't affect our hormones like it affects yours, so we don't physically feel it the way you do. And two, we have, like I said, our coping mechanism is a little bit different. What happens when a guy gets home from a stressful day? Cracks open a beer, drinks it, it's good. Stress, stress management in the bottle. Even if it's just one, even if it's just the sound, that's good enough. Or we eat 
Now, we don't eat good, healthy food. Ladies, you don't eat good, healthy food when you're stressed either. Because nobody comes home from a really stressful, hard day just pulling your hair out and want to just cry and think, I need an organic salad. That would just, oh my goodness, that would just taste so good. <laughs> nope, doesn't work. What do we eat? <sighs> Chocolate cake. Danny's favorite. We eat dessert, sweet, 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 any kind of car we can get our hands on. Why? Because we've been stressed out all day, and we'll get into this in a second, so I won't want to skip ahead, but this is how men deal with stress. We eat, and when we're done with that meal, our stress level goes from here to here. Or we crack open that beer, and it goes from here to here. Until we got to deal with you ladies. <clears throat> oh, crap, my mic's on. <laughs> ladies are a little bit different, because you will have the stressful day, you will drink your cup of stress, and then you'll think about the stress all day long, and then the next day, and then the next day. And like I said, our hormones aren't hooked up the way yours are. Well, they are, but they're not. So when we actually look, the big thing to realize is that tomorrow that stress is going to be there too, so why worry about it? Seriously. I don't get it. Right? You have a job, you're going to go there, you're going to deal with the same idiots. They're still going to be idiots. You're going to drive down the same bumpy road. You're going to drive through the same roundabouts. You're going to do all this stuff, and you're still going to get mad about it every single day. Stop it. Stop it. Deal with it. Let it go. I'm not going to sing. I promised everybody on the planet I would not sing, and I'm not going to. Right? But, but seriously. Seriously. Let it go. I don't care what it is. Even if it's, even if it's me pissing you off, let it go. Get over it. I don't care. I really don't care if I make you mad. So... Um, <laughs> but why do we eat sugar with stress? Who's had your stress hormones tested? I know a bunch of you have. Now, cortisol is your stress hormone, okay? What does cortisol actually do? Now, the real job of cortisol on a day-to-day -day basis is nothing more than to give you energy to wake up and get out of bed. That's it. That's why the rhythm always goes low, high in the morning, and then peters out to nothing. That's really what it does. It starts climbing at 2 to 3 o'clock in the morning, increases your blood sugar to give you energy, and you wake up. And as soon as you start moving around, your body starts breaking it down. Now, who lives in that world? Nobody raised their hand. Okay, right, because nobody actually does. This lady came in last year, middle of last year, and guess what she hated? Why is she so stressed out in the morning? What does she hate? What did she stress out about more than anything? Somebody. Hit me. Huh? Who said job? Job. You're right. She worked with an a-hole. I won't say his name. But she made, he made her life a living hell, and she hated her job. But she needed to make money for her life. So she went to work, and she had this. This line right here is the upper limits of where your stress hormone should be. That's her right there. Okay, now, we're gonna get to her in a little bit as well when we go through her hormones, but this actually, what stress does, like I said, what stress hormone does, it increases your blood sugar. Blood sugar increases your insulin levels. Insulin deposits fat, I mean deposits sugar into tissue to be stored as fat. Stress makes you fat. Stop stressing out. It's just that easy, right? So <laughs> now, when you actually look at what her future test does, because she came in recently, we went over her updated labs. What do you think changed between here and here? She quit her job. It's amazing what changing your life circumstances does, right? Because if you look, here's her stress level, stress hormone level, We're way up there, pegged in the red. It's overflowing, danger signs all over the place. Now, or is it? Way down the green, which is normal. Stress was killing her, literally. And we'll get into that in a little bit. But what's the best thing you can actually do? And ladies know this answer better than men when you're stressed. When you don't really crave that organic salad, what do you crave? Chocolate. chocolate. Why do you have to eat chocolate to be healthy? And I'm sorry if you're allergic. 
I am. Did you bring it for me? She's going to smash her chocolate. I told her, don't smash the chocolate. Save the chocolate. So, number one source of magnesium of any food. Why is that important? What does magnesium do? Helps calm you. Helps relax muscle tissue. Some of the benefits of cacao, which is actually what chocolate really is. That's a picture of what chocolate looks like. Contains PEA. You know what PEA is equivalent to in your body? Feelings of love. So now you eat it, you feel relaxed, you feel love. And then we have epicatechins, which actually increase your ability to get benefit from exercise. You get stronger when you eat chocolate. So now you're getting stronger, you're feeling love, you're feeling relaxed. Tryptophans, who's had turkey? The old turkey nap, Thanksgiving. Very calming and relaxing, right? And then you get down, serotonin. Who knows what serotonin is? It's a brain hormone. What does it relate to the brain? Happiness. So now we're happy. We're relaxed. We're feeling love. We're getting stronger. Everything is good. And then it helps, relate, helps women release oxytocin, which is why women equate chocolate to sex. So now ladies get sex. They get happy. They get relaxed. They get sleepy. They get love. And they get strong. And they replace you guys with chocolate. <laughs> you wonder why women love chocolate so much. But the bad news is at the bottom. All those wonderful things are destroyed when it's heated. Now, what happens when you heat real chocolate? What do you turn it into? Milk chocolate. Hershey Kisses, right? The crap that is produced and most eaten on Happy Valentine's Day. So next time your guy gets you, uh, Hershey Kisses for chocolate, take them, chuck them at his head. You'll feel the magnesium. You'll feel the relaxation come over you. Okay? But this is what chocolate... Chocolate was actually traded as money. It's so, it was so valuable back by the ancient Incans, which is why I believe the, the, the saying money doesn't grow on trees came from because it actually used to grow on trees. That's the power of chocolate. Okay? So inflammation comes in many, many different forms. Now, if I sprain my ankle... What happens to it? It swells, it swells up. It becomes inflamed and it swells up because it takes in a ton of water to help calm down the inflammation. Okay? What happens to our system when we become inflamed? It swells up. And what do we retain? A ton of water. So if our system is inflamed, it's impossible to lose weight because we're so full of water. Everybody talks about how everybody feels puffy and everything like that, or you look puffy. It's water. It's water from inflammation. Okay? Now, what causes inflammation? You've been here before, you know the answer. Say it. I'll give you a clue, it's the three T's. Okay, traumas, yep, toxins, thoughts. You didn't say them in the right order. You would have won a prize. But traumas, toxins, and thoughts, all these different things cause inflammation in our system. So when we talk about trauma, what are we talking about? You were doing it. Thank you. You are crossing your legs. I was looking for everybody crossing their legs. You too. Her in the pink sweater. It's crossing her legs. Okay. Trauma. We're going to get to it in a minute. Toxins. Can we eat toxins? Absolutely. Thoughts. Stresses. We already kind of covered that. But traumas. Posture correction. There's a cool app that was actually developed by chiropractors out in New York for phones, and it's called Posture Corrector. It's not available for Apple yet. I have no affiliation with this. I don't care. I saw it, and I think it's cool. But the lower you hold the phone, the dimmer the screen gets, you can't see it. How cool is that? Because this is not how we're meant to walk around. That's why the newest generation of kids is going to be putting chiropractors' kids through college and whatever for forever, okay? The development of technology has vastly accelerated past what the human body has evolved to, right? We're not meant to bend in those specific directions. Ladies, crossing your legs. Not only will it develop varicose veins and those unsightly bulges on legs, but knee pain, ankle pain, hip pain, low back pain for the rest of your life. So stop it. Thank you. I was going to come over there and uncross them pretty soon. So, other traumas. Has anybody here been born? 
Nobody raised their hand. Okay? Moms who give birth, is it a traumatic experience? Is it a traumatic experience for the child coming into the world? So immediately they're having postural or stressful trauma to their nervous system that causes inflammation, alters how their body and brain function. Christopher Reeve, Dale Earnhardt. What happened to Christopher Reeve? Fell off his horse. He didn't break his arms. He didn't break his legs. He broke his neck. And it put pressure on his spinal cord, and he lost function of all those things. Dale Earnhardt, his official cause of death was lung failure. A lot of people don't know that. Okay? But when he hit the wall, same thing. Problem in the neck, put pressure on the cord, and he lost all function to his lungs, and his lungs stopped functioning. That's how he actually died. Trauma. Now, there's also sports. There's also putting 50-pound backpacks on your 40-pound kids and making them walk to school like this and, you know, crossing our legs and sitting playing video games or sitting like this for six hours, right? So there's all these different traumas you have to be evaluated for to make sure your body can actually function properly or it's going to be inflamed. You're going to retain water and you're not going to lose weight. Toxins, foods. Can foods be poisonous? Yes. yes. If you've been to our information talk, you know that even avocados can almost cause people to get their entire bowels cut out of their body. Even avocados, which is one of the healthiest fats on the planet, correct? Correct. For you, 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 but maybe not you, right? Environmental toxins. The only people that really get toxins in their system are people who eat, breathe, or drink. That's it. Because when you leave here, if you jump up over, 41, over 43 Bridge, you know that those smokestacks aren't really producing organic water vapor. Right? If you've driven past Santa Max, you know <laughs> that ain't right. <laughs> Thoughts. Here you go. Let it go. I was taught this rule shortly a while ago, the 5x5 the five five rule. Anybody know that rule? It's not the square rule. It is, if it won't matter to your life five years from now, don't spend more than five minutes thinking about it. Because it really, really doesn't matter. If the lawn doesn't get cut today, and it gets cut tomorrow, it's not a big deal. Right? If dinner is a little bit burnt because I cooked it, it's a little bit dry, it's okay. I hope she's not watching. Love you, honey. Ah, she puts up with a lot. Anyway, so when we talk about these things like traumas and toxins and thoughts, they're, they're the three things that actually are at the foundation of how we get sick in the first place, okay? If all those things, if you are completely clear of all three T's, you are the healthiest person on the planet. Guarantee it, okay? Hormone deficiency and imbalance. Now, this is where men and women go on separate paths, okay? Because when you look at this, there will be a quiz, and if you don't get it right, you can't leave until you get it right. And if you get it right, you get chocolate. Just kidding. Anyway, so right down here, it might be hard to see, right here on this screen, right here is cortisol. Remember cortisol, the stress hormone? Now, cortisol is a fight or flight, life or death hormone. So if a giant grizzly bear smashes through that door right now, I'm going to be okay because I can outrun some of you. But if a giant grizzly bear smashes through that door, your stress level is going to go up. Yes? Do we need it to to survive? Because it's going to give us energy. It's going to give us strength to get away from the stressor. Now, if we get away from the stressor and we're safe and sound, what happens to your stress level? It goes down. Now, who just randomly walks across the bear these days? Besides hunters. But we don't randomly encounter a stress here and there anymore, do we? No. Especially in Green Bay, since they put the roundabouts in. <laughs> I'm sorry, people do not know how to drive through those. And what's made it worse is that it's left of way, it used to be right of way, now people at four-way stops don't know what the hell they're doing either. It's a mess. Good Lord. Anyway, twice I've seen people going the wrong way down an exit, down an off-ramp. You're coming back down the on-ramp. And it's both times it's by Mason and 41 by the festival there. They're coming back this way on the 41. Both times it was a Buick, which is like mine, so you know who was driving it. Anyway. <laughs> I'm sorry. But anyway, 
here's your stress hormone, and I want you to think of this as a little plug right there. Now, every time you experience chronic stress, you're going to need more stress hormone to deal with it because your body doesn't really know the difference between a grizzly bear and an idiot in a roundabout. It's a stressor, and your body reacts the same way regardless. You secrete extra cortisol, and if you don't have enough, you can pull this plug right here, and you can start converting these hormones down to cortisol. And you create hormone imbalances. And you also keep that plug open because, like I said, we have all those different jobs that we go through all the day, and then we have the stressors of the people driving crazy through roundabouts and traffic on 172 and the bridge is closed in Green Bay and you got to drive from the east side to the west side and holy hell, it takes 10 minutes. <laughs> I don't understand. I'm not a Green Bay native. I, I really don't understand it. It's 10 minutes. Anywhere to Green Bay from one spot to another, it's 10 minutes. If you got to go from east to west, it's 10 minutes. But man, if you got to cross that bridge, that is stressful. <laughs> what the heck? I, <laughs> I don't get it. Anyway, because I live on the east, I drive to the west every single day. I mean, I, I, get, the, yeah, I, I get some of it, but why is it such a dramatic event? Anyway, but if you can't shut this off, if your body doesn't think, if your body thinks you need to survive, even if you're just driving and there's a cop behind you, and you're going well within the speed limit, but you're stressed because what if your taillight's out? What if your sticker's not on right? What if this? What if he pulls me over? It's a stressful event, and your body thinks you're being chased by a grizzly bear. Okay? That's how we start draining these hormones on this side, but we really don't affect those over there. Now, this is where the men and women separate, because what's over there? Testosterone. We're really okay with stress because it really doesn't pull down our hormones. And when we do start to lose our hormone, we don't go through the migraines, we don't go through the, all the different experiences like the hot flashes, the cold spells, the irregular cycles, and things like that. We don't. We just f feel okay. That's it. I know it's not fair. But thank God every day that I was born a man. But over here, progesterone, now we really need this to help regulate our menstrual cycle. So if we start draining that, we start creating hormone imbalances, and then our entire cycle and everything starts to go crazy. And we have this unique system, which is kind of cool. Kind of uncool, but it's there for survival. Because really what happens is that the human body doesn't make mistakes. People make mistakes, okay? So when we go through all these constant stressors and everything like that, we have these systems that our body will help us survive for as long as possible to remove that stressor so that we can start to function more normally again, okay? Now, we have this obesity estrogen cycle. Now, we start to have a decrease in muscle and increase in fat, and we start to gain weight. We start to build body fat. And what that body fat does as we increase our obesity, it increases this little enzyme called aromatase. And what that does is it helps convert testosterone to estradiol, which is one of the strongest estrogens. Now, when you take testosterone and convert to estrogen, what happens in men? Man boobs. Man boobs, and you start hearing about men getting breast cancer. Right? So then, when we convert this, we have an increase in estrogen, which causes an increase in fat and a decrease in muscle mass, which increases obesity, which increases aromatase, which increases their conversion to estrogen. You know what food does this? Soy. Soy is a hormone disruptor, and it increases aromatase and increases this conversion. That is why you're getting little girls getting puberty at the ages of seven and eight, and you're getting delayed puberty in boys, and they're becoming a lot more effeminate now. Their features are changing because we're messing with their hormones at a very, very young, young age. Most of the formulas and all that garbage has soy in it, so we're feeding it to them from birth. Okay? Now, this, remember that lady who had all the stress from her job? This is her hormone test. Now, this is her second hormone test. It's a hell of a lot better than the first. But a little history on her, she had breast cancer. She had a double mastectomy. And then she's had surgery to do all the repairs and everything like that. But she has no more breast tissue, correct? Double mastectomy. People are volunteering for this service now. But when you go through and you see all these, we're going to zoom in at the bottom. Because these are her primary estrogens. Right here. One, two, three. And how your body breaks these down is really 
major key to find out because especially with breast cancer, there's this little bugger right here called 4-hydroxyesterone. Now, if this becomes dominant and your body can't get rid of it, it will bind to and damage DNA. What do we call damaged DNA in our body? Say it. It begins with a C. Cancer. cancer. This is post-breast cancer. This is post-double mastectomy. She is still ripe for cancer. She doesn't have breast tissue. It doesn't matter. It's not a breast cancer-specific hormone. But when this becomes large, we can't get rid of it, she will put it in other tissue, ovarian tissue, pancreatic tissue, lung tissue, right? Now, this is the one that says, can she get rid of it? What's it say? Nope. Her body won't let her get rid of it. So she needs help, otherwise she's going to develop more cancer. And yes, I told her that. And yes, she smiled and thanked me when she left. But then again, she was really happy not to be working with Josh anymore. <laughs> okay. I hope he's not watching. So, immune system. Now, we have a whole bunch of different things that develop, uh, challenge our immune system. And the primary is going to be what? 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 Somebody's got to yell it. You can yell it. Okay. All right. Food. Food. Food, food, food. Now, who's had their food allergies tested? You all should have known that answer. Should we go back? Okay. What? Thank you. So now, these are two grossly different food allergy tests. Now, what is a food allergy? And why is it important? Well, these are called IgG reactions. So let's say I get... Epstein-Barr virus, I get mono, okay? Now, your body is going to develop these IgG antibodies to look for it in case you come across it again so you can destroy it faster. It's very smart, the immune system. Now, the difference between having an IgG to food and IgG to a virus, because when you have a virus, you feel like garbage, you're laying on the ground, you're sweating profusely, you feel like vomiting, you have no appetite. A virus gets into your system and replicates and gets a all over the place. A food doesn't. Food doesn't replicate unless you keep eating it, okay? So what these numbers represent is how many actually foods she reacts to and how many antibodies she has to that specific food. The reaction to those foods, whether it's a plus one, two, three, or four, is gonna be the same every single time. It just depends on when her immune system actually finds the food, okay? Now, you know what the difference is between the person with 29 and the person with eight is, besides 21 foods? Nothing. You get your test, you get your food results, you look at it, and everybody reacts the exact same way, and I laugh my butt off every single time because I did the same thing when it was my eight right there on the bottom. That's mine. What the hell am I going to eat? <laughs> I mean, I looked, I was like, yes, I'm allergic to pinto beans and clams and oysters and scallops. Who eats those? And then I kept looking. Onion. Where's onion? Everywhere. Where's pepper? Everywhere. Where's brewer's yeast? Beer. <sighs> I know. Vodka. Yeah. But you look up here at hers, she's allergic to chocolate, and she's allergic to brewer's yeast. Where else is brewer's yeast? Wine. So you look at a woman, you're like, you're allergic to chocolate and wine. And I am sorry. <laughs> right? But this is why this is so important, because if you go through my book and look at the recipes and make those foods, and you have allergies to those foods, it's going to make you sick. So this is why paleo doesn't work for some people. This is why keto doesn't work for some people, or Atkins, or all these other diets, because even the blood type diet, you can have all these foods on it. I can have all these foods on the blood type diet. And I'd get very, very sick. That's why we have to be specific in each individual person because you are all unique from the person next to you, right? You're better than they are. No? Okay. Oh, I skipped that. There she is. Does everybody know Fancy Nancy? Fancy Nancy's back there. Now, 
She's wearing a really silly shirt in the picture on the left, but that was in November, shortly before she got her food allergies results back. Now, what did she say when she got her food allergies back? What the hell am I going to eat? But what did she really say was, does this mean I'm not allergic to Skittles? <laughs> it's on video. You can see it. We actually recorded it. She, that is exactly what she said. But this is the difference from November to March. She lost 20 pounds. How different did she look? Massively different. How much exercise do you do? None? Oh, that's crazy. But what did she change? She changed how she looked at food. She changed not eating toxic food. She stopped eating poisons. Every food on this list, to me, is like a virus. To every person, if you're allergic to those foods, it's like a virus. How much of a virus do you have to get in your system to get really, really sick? But what if I just have a little onion? These are the things I have to listen to every single day. What if I just have a little chocolate? It's not going to kill me. No, it's not going to kill you immediately unless you look down and drop it while you're driving and hit a car. <laughs> that still doesn't mean you want to get sick, right? And the good thing that this does with people is it solidifies the fact that what? Who's in control of whether or not this lady eats those foods? Who's in charge of whether or not I eat these foods? Even if I don't know they're in stuff. Which onion is everywhere. It's in ketchup. It's in ketchup. I had a conversation with my father-in-law, and I told him that I'm allergic to pepper and onion and this other stuff, and we were at his house, and he made dinner. He made burgers on the grill. He's like, didn't season them. Didn't put any pepper or onion in them just for you. It's like, thank you. That's very nice. Squirt some ketchup on there. I'm halfway through eating them, and I stopped myself. I was like, huh. So you finish the burgers, of course. I mean, you've already eaten it. Might as well eat a little bit more. But that's, that's the thing with learning these. That's why we have food consultations where people actually sit down with you and say, yes, you can eat that, but here's what you can do. And what does that do to stress levels? <sighs> We've had multiple people be like, I was at the grocery store for two hours. I got three things in my cart. <laughs> Help. This is a cousin of ours. She had hers and her sons, and they had 50 food allergies to look at. So they went to the grocery store, and she called bawling. She's like, help me out. Literally, two hours in the store, she had five things in her cart. It's not easy. I mean, I'm not saying it's, it's, I'm not saying it's easy, right? But once you know, now you can make a plan moving forward, like Nancy did. Doesn't she look great? Good job, Nancy. Everybody give her a round of applause. So, where is most of your immune system? Everybody says stomach. It's not stomach. It's in the gut. The rest of the gut. The GI. The gastrointestinal system. In the intestines, right? That's where all those bacteria are. That's why everybody eats the probiotics. It's, they're trying to help the immune system. Well, they're probably eating stuff that they're allergic to with probiotics in it. So when you look at the actual health of your immune system, that's a whole nother key. Because when we talk about stresses, we talk about mental stresses and traumatic stresses and things like that. Your nervous system, your brain, is your most important organ of your body. Would you agree? Without it, you're dead. That's how they tell if you're dead. If your EEG goes flatline, you're dead, right? That's why they used to put the bells on the fingers in the coffins back in the old day, right? Because if all of a sudden the person working the graveyard shift heard the jingle of the bell, you had to go dig the person up because they were burying people alive because their heart stopped and everything else started, but the brain's still working, they're still alive. Next important is your immune system. Because if you're chronically stressed, or if that bear's chasing me, I need my nervous system to be my predominant system and take everything from my body and give it everything it has to survive. Likely, if I have a major infection, like a virus or something like that, how well do you think? Not very well, right? Because you divert energy from your nervous system over to your immune system. And those systems are always in flux, depending on which one is stressed. So when you look at this kid's immune system, and these are all bacteria in his gut. See all these H's? Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Eleven bacterial infections. Which might not seem like much because these are normal bacteria that actually have just, he's got way too much of them. He walked into the office with major ticks. Where he's going like this. Like every five seconds. 
they got better for a long period of time, and then they started to come back. So we said, we got to figure out what's going on in there because where are half of all your brain hormones made? 90% of happiness is in here. 90% of that serotonin is in here. That's why when you get that gut feeling, when you get that pit in your stomach, that's why you want chocolate because your body's like, serotonin, chocolate, right? So go further into this test. He doesn't have any pathogens, but he's got some yeast overgrowths, right? Then this one, parasites. Parasites all over in his gut. So if your brain hormones are made in here and you've got parasites and other bacterial infections driving the environment crazy, what happens to the nervous system? You ever hear the gut-brain connection? Right? That's why. Brain hormones are made in here, and if the environment of your immune system is shot or if it's being disrupted, it's going to affect how your brain works. Okay? Now, this is Mark. If you can see the picture, it looks really clear on here. His hands are all torn up and scabby with eczema, right? Have you ever had bleeding sores on your hands? I have not, but this is what he came in with. Now, what is his job? If you don't know Mark, he is a traveling salesman. So he's got to drive all over northeast Wisconsin, okay, with hands like that. Now, he had to get a special cover put on a steering wheel because every couple minutes he had to change hands because his hands hurt so bad, and they were bleeding all over. Now, if you ever made a deal with a salesman, how do they close the deal? Shake hands. So he's like this. Okay? Now, what was found on his stool test was a parasite just the same. He had a bunch of bacterial overgrowth and a parasite as well. Different one than the other guy had, but this, he had parasites as well. So what happens when you go in, the only thing that happened was he went in, killed the parasite, and helped the system heal up a little bit. What happened to his skin? What was he ever given for his skin? Nothing. Nothing. But before he came to us, because we often joke that we should be called the last resort, because that's the type of people that come into our office. It's like, I tried everything else. I'll give you guys a shot. Thanks, I guess. But he came in after multiple, multiple bouts of steroid creams. And when he used the steroid creams, the rash would go away. But as soon as the prescription ran out, the rash would come right back. So we went on the inside, helped kill the parasite, and helped fix the gut, and then the skin changed. Okay? How does that relate to weight loss? If your system is like that, you're not going to be able to lose weight. Okay? Actually, look at his fingers. Don't they look like big, puffy sausages? That's water retention from inflammation. Without really doing anything for weight loss, what do you think he did? Look at the fingers. Isn't that crazy? So start here. This is where you start. Don't go on Instagram. Look up random fitness person and look at their body and say, Damn. that person makes a living with their body. You need your body to live, okay? Huge difference. They're probably, most likely, 99% of the time, very, very sick, okay? Because of the way that they've beaten their bodies up so bad that they can't actually respond anymore. So, and if you're looking at them, trying to say, I want to look like that, you're stressing yourself out first, you're more likely to quit, you're more likely to give up if you screw up one little thing. Like if you're me and you're trying to lose all this weight and you're like, oh, onions in there, <sighs> onions in everything, screw it, I'm just going to eat. We hear that a lot, okay, and it's tough. It's not easy avoiding all this stuff, but once you do and you make it just, like I said, a change of way you actually look at food as fuel, then you're not going to start putting that stuff in your system. We take better, car better care of our cars than we do ourselves, right? We don't go and put salt in the gas tank or sugar or oil, or anything else. We don't go put water in our tires, right? It's just silly, right? We don't put a rubber band as a, as a serpentine belt because that's not what our engine needs. But we'll spend thousands of dollars having our car tuned up and fixed, and then we'll drive through McDonald's with it. <laughs> I, <laughs> going to my barber the other day, you have to drive past the McDonald's through their parking lot. And they actually have a sign now. I didn't know if anybody else knew this, but not only can you go and sit down at McDonald's and eat, you can go through the drive through and eat. Now you can order on the app and pull up, and they'll bring the food out to you. Curbside McDonald's. It's getting easier and easier and easier to eat crap. And what do we do when we're stressed out and we're running behind and we don't have many other options? What do we do? We choose to eat crap instead of eating nothing. Because food is always more what? 
emotional than it ever is physical. We have an emotional attachment to food. You try taking away my beer, I was very upset. Very upset. Okay? So it, it's stressful to try to take these foods away. I had to tell a lady yesterday, well, it was funny because I walked in. It wasn't yesterday, it was Tuesday. I walked in to go over her food allergy test results, and I walked in the door. I didn't know what they were. I walked in the door, and she looked up at me like this. <laughs> and I looked, I was like, uh-oh. I walked over, and I opened them up. Chocolate, yeast. What am I going to do? I can't eat chocolate. Give me something. You got to help me out. You got to save me. I was like, all right, you can replace chocolate with caramel. <gasps> you can? Oh, my God. Thank you so much. Seriously. Seriously, that was a conversation I had Tuesday, and it was awesome. So, Natasha, if you're watching, hi. I didn't see you here. But there's bright lights in my face. So, so who's done any kind of fasting before? Okay. Now, the longer you fast, the more you're actually starving your body of food, so it actually goes and looking for stuff to burn. Intermittent fasting really doesn't exist, or it doesn't work right. The whole 16-8 and things like that where you just skip a meal, you have to go through a full period of like a circadian rhythm, like that full cortisol rhythm, to actually get it to really have a benefit. Studies show that actually if you do a three-day water fast, you can totally take all the stress out of your system, and you can totally reset your food allergies. That is why, in my opinion, I only have eight. Last year, I did two three-day water fasts for no other reason than I just needed to give myself a break. And it's amazing the break that you actually give yourself. I know. It's tough, right? <laughs> and we always joke about it. If there's a husband and wife, here we go, if we tell you guys that you can't have sex for a week, he'll get upset with me, and she'll be like, meh, all right? But if I tell you both you have to do a three-day fast and you can't eat anything for three days except water, they're both going to be pissed, right? Because food is always more emotional than ever is physical. We don't need food every single day five times a day. That whole metabolism myth is junk. It's actually ass backwards, right? Because what is metabolism but a system of breakdown of tissue? We call that aging. Who wants to speed up the aging process? Not a single hand went up. Okay? But that's what it is. Metabolism and aging. Everybody wants to get faster metabolism to burn more food because if you jump on a treadmill and burn 30 calories, you can eat 2,030 versus 2,000. Okay? All those recommendations and everything, all the biggest loser programs and everything are designed on that calorie in, calorie out myth. That doesn't work. Stop counting calories. Because if I eat 2,000 calories at McDonald's, and I burn 2,000 calories, I'm still going to get sick. I'm still going to gain weight, I'm still going to get all puffy, and I'm going to get sick. If I eat 2,000 calories of really, really good stuff, and I burn 10 calories, I'm still going to get healthy. I'm still going to lose weight. You can eat 10,000 calories a day of really healthy food for you and lose weight. I know. I know what you're thinking. But I've been told, but I've been told, I've been told for years and years and years, look where we are. Look where that map was heading. We weren't getting healthier, we were getting sicker. So the way to actually really do a fast is either one day a week, well, you don't have to do it every week, but a full one day, 24-hour fast will get you into a spot where you are turning, burning a ton of fat. Because if you just do the 16-8, you start barely burning fat. Okay? But if you go for a full 24 hours, then you're burning a massive amount. And if you go for three, then you're just going to be fueling your fat. And what happens is after the first day when you get kind of tired and get kind of cranky and get irritated and you want to punch everybody in the throat, is you start thinking clear, your energy levels start coming up because you start burning fat. Now, fat is a cleaner burning source than anything else. Now, that whole, if anybody saw the article we did on ketosis or the show we did on ketosis on our Facebook show, we got a lot of hate for that one. By telling people, if you tell people that their program isn't exactly perfect for everybody, they get pissed. People have been doing ketosis. This one guy did it for 15 years. BS. B, period, S, period. Nobody can be in ketosis for that long and survive. It's a starvation mode. Your body needs sugars to survive. It does. You need sugar. You need things like glucosamine for your joints to be healthy, right? Glucosamine is a sugar. Xylitol is a sugar. These things are sugars. We need them to feed our brain. We need them to feed our muscles. 
if you don't have them, you will be really good high energy for a short period of time. And then you'll start to burn out. Now, what should we eat? Let's get into it. Now, on a normal day, if you're allergic to something, don't eat it every single day. That goes for everybody. We always talk about that. You should eat this unless you're allergic, unless you're allergic, unless you're allergic. Don't eat anything you're allergic to. You'll be a lot healthier, happier and healthier, okay? Now, more fat. I tell people that, they get really sketchy. We don't eat enough fat. We don't eat close to enough fat. You mean like a, like a tablespoon? No, I mean like a ton of fat. I had today one of my favorite treats is, if you saw the bone broth article with the collagen and in the, the coffee drink I talked about, I talked about it a lot. It's a full fat can of coconut milk with 60 grams of saturated fat. Oh, so good. I had one this morning, as a matter of fact. So we need more fat. We need it because we need it for our brain. We need it for our body. We need it to fuel and clean out our system. The more sugar we eat, the more we're actually going to break down our system, cause inflammation and rust, because that's what sugar does. That's why Alzheimer's disease is called diabetes type 3, because when our blood sugar stays high for an extended period of time, it starts to eat away at the memory centers. The goal you're looking for, if anybody knows your A1C, is 5.3. You get no degeneration when it's below 5.3. When it goes up above, your brain starts shrinking. The memory centers do it. It starts rotting out. And that's why Alzheimer's disease is related to diabetes. Okay? Now, lean proteins, more collagen. Why do I say more collagen? It's because of this. Most of our proteins that we get, most of our protein powders and things like that are amino acid based. Why is that important? Because they feed muscles. And we become a system of people that are really strong musculature wise and our joints suck. Look no further than Jordy Nelson if you want an example. Right? What was he doing in that preseason game? He was running down, nobody touched him, he put his foot down, his knee blew up. Because his collagen and his joints, the ACL, the MCL, whatever he blew out, was so weak. Right? You look at these young guys in the NBA, they're all blown out their ACLs. If you watch the NBA, I mean, I won't waste my time. But joints, 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 joints. Everybody has back pain, but nobody eats collagen. Okay, we need massive amounts, I shouldn't say massive amounts, but we need a hell of a lot more collagen in our joints, in our body, because we need to fuel all of our joints. Okay? Huh? Where do you get collagen from? You go visit great grandma and have her make her some chicken soup. Because what do they put in the chicken soup, grandmas? The bones, bone broth. All right? They put the whole chicken in there, and you actually got healthier from eating grandma's chicken noodle soup. Now it's just breast tissue meat and noodles and some carrots and celery. So it's very, very sugar friendly and very, very sugar heavy, I should say, and amino acid based. So we're going to build really strong muscles and we become really weak in our joints. We have shoulder pain, we have elbow pain, we have back pain, we have ankle pain, we have all these random pains, but we didn't really do anything. It's because the joints are dying, they're starving for nutrients and we're not giving it to them. So feed it, feed your joints, feed it. I love that Scott's commercial. I love that guy. Um, and a bunch of veggies and fruit. Makes sense? Now, if on a day you like go and work out really hard, you need more food. If you've noticed that on days you work out, you're like, I just want to keep eating and eating and eating. There's a joke around the office that if you run into me, I'm probably eating. Right? Roseanne always makes fun of me. Oh, what a shocker. Jason's eating. I'm hungry. I'm a growing boy, Roseanne. But on those days, you want to add a lot more sugar. I know that's blasphemy too, but what do your muscles eat? Sugar. So you need to refuel your system to help fuel your body, to help your body recover. Because if we can't recover, then you demand all these different hormones and you start pulling all these different hormones. And that's why you look at those really fit, ripped people in the gym that they have no cycle in six years. Okay, they're just depleting their body of all their hormones because they need them to repair their muscle tissue so they can survive. Okay? Now, immediately, especially immediately post-workout, because what happens if you don't eat a ton of sugar post-workout? Look no different than the marathon runners. The marathon runners get in that fat-burning zone, right? When you run and run and run and run and run. Sorry, runners, I used to be one, and then I couldn't run without icing my knees for two hours. Remember that? Oh, goodness. Me and him ran a half marathon, and I laid down for like an hour afterwards, like, I'm done. I'm retired. 
I couldn't do it anymore. My knees, I literally couldn't take it. My knees were like junk. So what was my point, squirrel? Oh, marathon runners. If you look at a picture of like the Kenyans, the most amazing, best marathon runners on the planet, what are their, their knees look like this and their muscles look like this. Because immediately after what happens, you get done out of that fat burning zone, now your body switches. Now it wants sugar. It wants sugar, it wants sugar, it wants sugar, it wants sugar, it wants sugar. And what in your body is really, really almost molecularly identical to sugar? Muscle. And it convert, it can lop a nitrogen off a of muscle tissue and make it into a sugar and eat it. So you actually start eating your own tissue. It's not a good weight loss technique. So runners, I don't care if you run every now and again, I don't. But if that's all you do, you're going to make yourself massively sick. Women. Women have to exercise different because if women exercise the same as men, you're going to get massively sick. Okay? So you have a cycle. You have four different weeks of your cycle that you have four different, massively different hormonal demands. And on two of those weeks, your body needs a lot of hormone. And if you're stressing it out with working out, you're going to get sick. You're going to deplete those hormones. You can still work out. I'm not going to take that away because especially, especially I love CrossFit. You tell a CrossFit girl not to do CrossFit. I did the other day. And she's like, what do you mean? I was like, well, are you just doing the workouts? And her mom was sitting right behind her. So it's was like, I was, she was you and you were her mom. And I was asking her this question. Her mom's like, I'm looking at her mom. I was like, is that all you do? And her mom's like, nope. She runs to the gym. She lifts a bunch of weights. She does the workout. She runs home. And then later she goes back to the gym and does all the extra work. I was like, okay. Now, this girl had massively bad hormones. She hadn't cycled in three years. She's 21, and she can't lose weight, even though she's exercising that often and that much. So in weeks one and three of your cycle, week one starts when you get your period. That's day one. Weeks one and three, you still have to do different stuff. You have to challenge your body in different ways. A functional movement is a movement that we need to function, okay? Think of a squat. I have to pick that up. Oh my goodness, I have to bend my knees and hips. This brings me back to the Packers. Okay, you know why their hamstrings suck and every year they have 20 guys out on the injury report? It's because they don't know how to move. I literally had one in my office once and he had hamstring troubles and this was in spring training. Spring training camps, I don't know what they're called anymore. I was like, okay, show me your squat. And he did this. This is a very athletic, very strong, fit individual who I would not ever mess with but I said, take off your shoes and show me your squat. And he did this. I was like, all right, there's your problem. So we started working with that. And all lo and behold, he started to get better. Okay? But they don't know how to teach them how to move. They can get them really strong. They don't know how to teach them how to move. And they're not getting any collagen. And that's why they're always hurt. Okay? But we're not their team doctors. So we can't help them. All right. Weeks two and four of your cycle go crazy. Hit it as hard as you want, lift all the weights you want, run, sprint, do everything you want without remorse, without guilt, without anything, and then eat 20 pounds of food after, and you will lose weight. But if you don't take one in week one and three off or take it easy, you're going to put that demand in your body and you're going to get sick. So you have to cycle through it a little bit different. Men, on weeks one through four of your cycle, <laughs> go crazy. Men can do it. Men can do it for a lot longer period of time because our hormones aren't, aren't, aren't wired like yours. They're not. So we can do it for a long period of time. Now, if we are silly and we're doing too much muscle damage through our working out and we're not supplying our body of what it needs, one of the things that we stress the most is the organ that actually is responsible for processing not only toxins, I'm saying that to give the answer away, but muscles, amino acids, and sugars. What is that? The liver. Liver is responsible for all that. Liver also produces cholesterol. So that's about the only time a cholesterol test is valid. Because if you see it and you start to see a number like 110, 120, 130, they need to take a break. They need to really help their liver out. Because there's this myth that you need low cholesterol to be healthy and not have a heart attack. Okay, false. But anyway, I'm not going to get into that. It's not this discussion. But if your cholesterol dips below 150, cholesterol makes up 15% of your brain fat. 25% of the brain fat, which is 15% of your total brain mass. What do you think when we start losing our cholesterol to our brain? 
you start losing the ability to communicate from one part to the other. And you start having all these neurological problems, even to the point where suicidal thoughts come into play. So get tested is my point. Now, like I said, men, men can go crazy because, you know, we're designed that way, you're not. It's just the way it is. Now, thoughts, stress. <sighs> Guys got it so easy. Most of the time it's because one simple thing. We just really don't give all that much of a crap most of the time. It's easy. It's easy for us. Oh, the kids were screaming at me all day. All right, spank their butt and put them in bed. I mean, it's just, just kind of how we think. But your daily mindset starts. If it starts with you stepping on the scale and getting stressed, about, stressed out about the number, the rest of the day is screwed. Who you are actually as a person is quite simple. You can do one of two things. You can ask somebody else or you can write down the things you say to yourself. Because you look at yourself in the mirror right away in the morning and that first thing you say to yourself, that gives a good indication of who you are. So don't be that person. Say something nice about yourself. Smile, laugh at yourself, get yourself out of that. And you'll be a hell of a lot happier, you'll have a hell of a lot better days and your stress levels will start to come down and you'll be a happier person. Because if you sit there and compare yourself to other people, you're gonna lose. Okay, compare yourself to you and then compare yourself to who you wanna be and who you were. That's really all that matters, okay, is you. So, five by five rule, if it won't matter five years from now, who gives a crap? Deal with it, move on, okay? Traffic. Now, I want you guys to, I, this is what I do, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna help you out here because we all drive, not just the roundabouts. I, I, I don't like them. I like them because you don't have to stop. I don't like them because people are gonna kill each other. But let's say you're driving and I'm driving my daughter to school in the morning and I get cut off by some guy flying through, weaving through traffic. What do I think? Or what do you think if you're in that situation? He's an idiot. You son of a... Yeah. You're, you're hoping to pull up even with him, like he gets stuck behind someone, so you can pull up next to him and be like... <laughs> Am I wrong? <laughs> you know what I think? And I've just been able to kind of train myself into this because I still catch myself doing the thing. But I imagine this. He had to cut me off because his kids are sick, they're in a car accident, his wife is sick, and he's in a hurry, and he's had a really crappy day. Now, does that change your perspective on it? So, does it really bother you if he cuts you off? No, if he starts slamming on his brakes in front of you, run him off the road. <laughs> but if you take into account that you don't know what that person's going through, how, you can't let somebody cutting you off in traffic stress you out and make you sick. Okay? Likewise, if somebody cuts in front of you in line at a grocery store, yeah, bump into them with your cart, but... That's about it. So there's two things we always tell people that we can't control, and that's the food you eat. We can tell you what not to eat, but we can't control you. That's your job. Because who's in control of what you eat? You are. And that's very important. Now, your external stressors is the other. Now, the lady I showed you her stress results, she took charge or she quit her job. That removed that stressor, but she's still gonna have other stressors in her life. That was the major. Now, if you look at your major stressors and you really, really, really worry about them and you go through this cycle to where, what's a good example I can use? I had a lady in who was not very healthy, but her mom was sick and her mom had to move into her house and it's really stressful on her because she's got to take care of her mom and her mom is sick and her mom doesn't want to listen. She doesn't want her mom to be living with her, okay? Now... I looked at her and I said, okay, what are you doing to make sure that you don't put that burden on your kids? And she looked at me, deer in headlights, and she's like, oh, crap. I'm still eating stupid. I'm still stressing out. I'm still doing all this stuff. So when we talk about priorities and, you know, our reasons for doing things and our whys, we're going to talk about it in a moment, but that has to be crystal clear to you. Because if it's not, we're setting ourselves up for failure. Okay? Now... Fear, it's got to be, you, how many of you wanted to smash the scale? Be honest, raise your hand. Be honest. You wanted to smash the scale. Did fear prevent you from smashing the scale? 
from stepping up and thinking, and did you care what other people are going to think about you if you walked up and smashed the scale? Okay? You can't really worry about what other people think about you because that's what other people think. If we control other people's thoughts, we, oh, man, we could create some trouble. <laughs> Am I right? Okay. But if you're afraid to do something, you know what's the best thing in the world? To do it. You know how proud you feel of yourself when you do that? You know what my biggest fear in the world is besides snakes? <laughs> Standing up in front of people and talking. I hate it. I hate it. It drives me nuts. I used to get paralyzed with fear to the point where you couldn't even understand me talking. Sure, I did a shot of California poppy about 20 minutes before people started walking in the door. <laughs> but my heart's not racing, and I'm not freaking out. My palms, are, my palms aren't sweaty. My knees aren't weak. Mom's spaghetti. Eminem, nobody? Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll be here all night, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. But you are in charge of your thoughts. You're in charge of how you deal with stuff. If it doesn't matter, don't worry about it. Okay? Now, your lifestyle. This is the easy part. Or is it the hardest part? Let's get into it. So, we have a choice. Every day, the only person that controls what you choose is you. And I know the biggest argument is always, what about when I go out to eat? You get to choose what you eat. It's that simple. What if I go to a family's house and they have a bunch of crap? Eat the crap if you want. Don't stress about it, though. Eat it, get over it, and move on. Now, lifestyle choices, the biggest thing we eat bad is what? Sugar. What does sugar cause to be released? Insulin. When we stress out all the time, cortisol increases blood sugar. Blood sugar increases insulin. Insulin deposits fat in the liver and causes insulin resistance to the point where we start stockpiling insulin, insulin, insulin. We start stockpiling body fat, body fat, body fat, and we got diabetes, which leads to cardiovascular disease, cancer, and there's Alzheimer's. You know why it says 90% of diabetes is sugar-associated? What's the other 10%? Stress. I have a handful of patients that are actually type 2 diabetics, that are hard to manage because you can't get their insulin levels down because of stress. Because they won't stop stressing out. They don't eat a lick of sugar, but they have type 2 diabetes. They're lean, they're tall, and they're stressed. They're very tense people. Type A guys are the worst. Just relax. Especially if you have a bunch of stuff to worry about. Managers and things like that have the most stress. They will develop type 2 diabetes strictly from stress. But insulin resistance is a lifestyle problem. So let's talk about some death by lifestyle. Okay? Now, here is a blood sugar metabolism test. Green is good, yellow is look out, red is, we always make the joke, red is dead. It works because it rhymes. Okay? But insulin, 18, massively high because it should be about 3 to 5. See this hormone right here called leptin? Anybody know what leptin is? The opposite. It's the full hormone. It's secreted by your stomach. Your stomach starts to stretch, tells your brain you're full. Leptin, climbing high, is akin to leptin resistance. It always mimics insulin resistance. So to describe this in a person's everyday life, you eat your meal, you're full, you're done, you push your plate away, three, four seconds later, washing dishes, I'm just going to keep eating. The grazers after the meal are leptin resistant, okay? And it's never tested. Insulin is barely ever tested. The only thing ever monitored is sugar. And where is this guy's sugar? It's in the green. So he's normal. But he's massively insulin resistant, and now he's having all these other problems. So this is a good friend of mine. I'm going to embarrass him because he's in the room. But came to me a long time ago. We did some stuff. He went through. He started doing really good. He fell off the wagon. He called me up. He's like, all right, this time I'm coming to Green Bay. You can test anything you want. And my reaction was, yes. You can't give me carte blanche. I'm going to test a whole bunch of stuff. So we tested this. 
But along with this test also came cardiovascular test. You want to see it? Because this one doesn't look too bad, does it? Mm-hmm. Told you. Told you it was bad. Okay. All that red. Now, these bottom three are really important. Why? This one right here, are you going to develop a blood clot or a clot in your cardiovascular system? This one, are you more or less likely to have an immediate event? And the bottom one, this enzyme is one that circulates around and destroys your blood vessels. So they get really, really weak. And what do we call that? When they get too weak, stroke. Okay? The cool thing was this. <laughs> I told them when we went over these, I said, now, I'm friends with your mom on Facebook. And if you don't do what I say this time, I'm going to let her know. And then you're going to have to deal with her. Okay? But how do we change that around and get results by doing the exact same thing? So he texts me and he said, I have it right here. I copied and pasted it. I kept it. Hope you and your family had a great Christmas. I was wondering if the detox diet that we did a few years back is the best way to get started Start getting back on track with weight loss and exercise. I need to do something. I'm ridiculous. I'm way overweight. I feel like S, and I need something to kick my A into gear. Ugh. Any suggestions? What did I say? What's our wellness way model? We don't. So what did I say to him? Let's run some tests. Okay? Because you don't want to detox from somebody when they're not ready. So we ran some tests. And this was my friend that I've known for, I think I counted 34 years today. Oh, Kyle, I'm old. He's younger than me, though. So. so his insulin was up at 17, which is three times high. It was 282 pounds. His high was cholesterol, triglycerides, sugar, LDLs, and TPO, which is an antibody. All those things were high. And then four month, three and a half months later, he sent me a new one. Okay? Now, 30 pounds in three months he lost by changing some habits. How cool is that? His blood sugar, I mean his insulin, not quite cut in half, but it's working its way. Everything else went back to normal, except the LDL, which still came down 30 points. Just in a very short period of time, just by putting down, what were they, bear claws? Soccer dad, you know, we, we guys, we have our habits with our kids. We get in these routines where, you know, we get in your Saturday morning, let's go get some donuts. Now, at least in Green Bay, we can go to Happy Bellies, right? Go down to Appleton. But we get into these routes where we don't, he didn't go from a state champion sprinter and winning the 100 meter dash to 280 pounds in a week. It's a gradual process that takes time. So you don't notice it. And it takes time, and then all of a sudden you get sick of it. You start looking at things. Your energy's down. You're achy all the time. You don't have the energy to chase the kids. Then you look in the mirror, you're like, son of a gun. I'm ridiculous. And then you change it all around. So, exercise. How do we exercise? Don't run all the time. Do we have runners in here? People that go jogging three or four times a week? Am I irritating you right now? Okay. But you put that constant demand. It's a stressful event when you put yourself under that much exercise for that long of a time. And to be quite honest, there's no variation. It's not functional. The only time we really need to run is when we're, A, being chased by that bear or the cops then you got to be a really good runner, right? Only run when chased is my model. So I don't mind if you go out, run two, three, four, five miles once every week or two. I don't. But if you're, that's all you're doing, you're going to damage your joints, you're going to damage your muscles, you're going to develop insulin resistance, and all these other things that make yourself sick, and you're going to deplete your hormones, and you're not going to be able to lose weight. High intensity means nothing more than what it says. The heart rate goes north to a point where you got to stop. Or you get to that point where you can barely talk while you're breathing. Barely breathe while you're exercising. Can't talk while you're exercising. I did it. I figured it out. You get to that point where you actually have to stop, put your hands on your knees, and rest and recover before you can do anything else. That's exercise. That's meant to challenge your cardiovascular system to where it explodes the blood vessels so they become elastic and they can handle these things. Because if you don't, if you get, just don't challenge them, they become very rigid and they start to break. Now, here's the kicker. If it were easy, it would be easy. If it were easy, we'd all be walking around looking like Dr. Mitch, that handsome son of a gun over there, right? Right? 
nice and lean, mean, and we'd, we'd be eating the donuts, we'd be drinking the sodas, and we'd be, oh, look at the abs. <clears throat> Guys will still do it, but, all right, so if it doesn't actually challenge you, if it doesn't hurt, it's not going to work. If it doesn't hurt, it's not going to work. If you do all your exercise and you're walking around fine the next day, it didn't really do much. If you see some of us walking around the office sometime, we're walking around like this, and thank God for handicap rails on toilets sometimes. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh. <laughs> it's not fun, that burn. But, so the thing is that we have all these tools and we have to make decisions, okay? And it's not easy. It's not. And if it were, like I said, if it were easy, it'd be easy. But I love this movie quote. It popped into my head the other day. And I just added it yesterday to this talk. So listen to what he says. Now I have come to the crossroads in my life. I always knew what the right path was. Without exception, I knew. But I never took it. You know why? It was too damn hard. Right? It's hard to get up and exercise. It's hard to stop eating foods that we have come to love, that we've made this emotional connection to. It's not easy. It's not easy to get tested. It's not easy to take those and put in the work every single day to actually make a positive change in your life. But what do people always say that you need to find before you make a change? You have to find your why. Now, this is a trick question. What in that picture is my why? Yep, you nailed it on the head. Yourself. It has to be yourself. If you're doing it for somebody else, you'll quit. You'll always quit. If you have an accountability partner, they'll quit. Because they'll check in with you, and if they didn't like the response, they'll say, well, he doesn't give a crap, why should I? Those don't work. It has to be yourself. You have to put yourself first, because if you don't, if I don't take care of myself, who else can I take care of? Nobody. Nobody. So if you don't take care of yourself, you're going to expect other people to take care of you eventually. And where are they going to be? Hopefully there. What if they're not? Then you're screwed. Okay? So the point of all this is to really say what? Find out where you're at. If you want to make the changes, find out where you're at. Because if you don't, you don't know where you're going. Right? GPS only works if you know where you are and you know where you want to go. But if you don't know where you are, you don't know. So get tested. Now, this is one of the most easiest revealing tests that we have. Why? What's, where's most of your immune system? Now, if I were to tell you that this is supposed to be nice and gray, no black or white, besides the bones, what would you say? You can say it. You can swear. I can't. You can say, holy crap. Doesn't that look like the alien from the movie Alien? That's what I told her when I saw it. I was like, you swallowed alien, the one that popped out of the chest. That's what it looks like. <laughs> or this one, I asked her if she swallowed a rattlesnake because that's kind of what it looks like. That's what inflammation looks like. That's what a torn up immune system looks like. That's what a system that can't make brain hormones properly looks like. That person is very, very sick. Both of these people were women and they were both very skinny. So being sick or healthy doesn't determine weight. Weight doesn't determine, flip that, reverse that. Your weight doesn't determine how healthy you are, okay? All those women who are 150 are not the same level of health, correct? Okay. Now, oh, that was long. I talked a lot, and I'm sorry. So if you want to get tested, if you haven't been tested yet, you can go talk to Lauren back there, and she'll hook you up, and you can get tested for $99. What that means is that you can get your x-rays tested. You can bring in test work that you've had done previously, and we can look at them. We can go through a full exam and kind of recommend what we would actually test on you or what's your body specifically, what we need to find what's going on. Because if you don't find what's going on, what's making you sick, you can't make the change, right? You can run a whole bunch of tests, but if you're missing something, you're never going to get where you want to be, okay? So just by coming here tonight and putting up with my shenanigans, we'll discount it. But if you don't, you don't get it. You guess I'm saying. Sorry. Okay? Now, I do want to say thank you. 
Like I said, I didn't expect this many people to show up to hear me talk, so I'm kind of grateful. Now. Now. Now who wants it? Thank you, guys. You can have a great night. And if you want to smash these scales, I'm not taking them home. And you can't take them home either. So if you, you do me a great honor since I had to go to the store and get them, smash the hell out of them. Thank you. <laughs>